You want to do another one? <laughs> Good morning. It's good to see you today. We've got a lot of folks out for Labor Day holidays. Uh, how you doing, Jerry? We're here. I'm glad you guys made it. Oh, absolutely. Amen. That's how I know the rapture hadn't happened yet. <laughs> it is good to see you today. I want to remind you very briefly, there is this little form inside your bulletin. If you haven't been through one of our journey classes, the 101 class starts in just a couple of weeks. In fact, I think it's next Sunday afternoon. Four o'clock, it's about an hour, hour and 15 minute class. Make it, take it, it's a good time, Lord. I'll teach this class, kind of share the original Start of Believers Fellowship, our vision, where the Lord's, where we come from, where we're headed, what God's doing. So it's a very informative class about the church and the ministries of the church. So take time to come. Many of you have uh, recently started coming to Believers Fellowship. It's a great class. Maybe you haven't joined the church, you're thinking about joining the church. Come, sign up for this class, you'll find a little bit more about it, be able to ask some questions. Uh, in fact, you can join in the class uh, right there if you'd like. So, but you need to come, be a part of it. Just take the bottom part, very simply. Put your name information inside the offering box when you leave the service today. And we'll, we'll put you on the list to be there. Amen. Uh, if you've got kids, let us know. We'll take care of them. And just need to know that they're coming so we have an adequate number of people here to take care of them as well. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you. We're continuing our series as we've been in the last several weeks on apostasy and how apostasy is rampant in the day and the age that we're living in. The prophet or the teacher, the apostle, not the apostle, but the brother of Jesus, whose name was Jude, wrote this letter. And he writes it, which is a clear and accurate description of the day and the age which we are living in today. In fact, I don't think there's a clearer picture of it than in the Word of God. Several weeks from now, I'll be doing a new series on the end times and on prophecy. This is really the perfect kind of lead into that series as we talk about how the stage is set for all those things that the Bible talks about. In fact, there's some incredible things the Bible talks about in regard to the last days. Uh, maybe you've looked at those things. I just don't say that could be how it's going to happen. When you start realizing where we are culturally, you'll see how easily in years to come all this thing can already started falling into place. So if we're looking at the book of apostasy, uh, study in Jude and the end times and how it certainly is rampant in the culture that we're living in today. Hopefully uh, you're ready for today's message. If not, uh, seat belts are provided. Just raise your hand for an usher. Because this really gets down to the nitty gritty. This gets down to where the rubber meets the road, so to say. This gets down to some things that are not palatable and are acceptable in the culture that we're living in. In fact, this borders on intolerance. We talked about that last week. Maybe you'll get the line. All right. Let's just jump into the Word. And Jude, we've already gone through the first seven verses. Well, I'm going to give you about five or six verses today. We'll try to get through a couple of them. All right. We're just kind of taking it line by line and word by word. Said in the same manner, these men also by dreaming, they defile the flesh and they reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael... I'm clicking, there we go. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men revile in things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe unto them, for they've gone the way of Cain. And for pay... They have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These men are those who are hidden reefs in your love feast. And when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along but by the winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. There you have his simple opinion on apostates about who they are and what they are and what they are. You know, it, it, uh, you think about so many, uh, you know, over the years that you've seen in the culture and even through history, he gives a, a little history lesson continually throughout this book. Last week we talked about some of those that fall into the category of apostates and says these, the present day apostates, are just like the, the past day apostates. And he just basically says in the end times, in the day that we're living in, it's going to be very common. Remember what we said apostasy was? It was, to, it was to, to, to abandon the truth. In other words, you have a familiarity with it. You know, you have it in your head. You don't have it in your heart. Some people believe our apostates are those who have fallen away and lost their salvation. Well, we dealt with that in the first few verses. Uh, he's not saying, he said, if you are a saved person, you're preserved until the day of judgment. He said, but these are people who have, like Peter said, like a form of godliness. 
They're religious, they have a for- but they deny the power of it on their life. In other words, they have this head information, but they have no heart transformation. There's no genuine commitment to, to Jesus as Lord in their lives. They go through religion, they, they, they may be a part of some particular denomination, but when it gets down to it, you know, they are not genuine believers. Thus we have this term of people who, who know the truth, they become familiar, but then they just reject it. You know, and this is where we are, you know, the, in, in the day and the age. So we see that it's to know and reject the truth. Again, we see it in history when Isaiah was prophesying it and the Gospel John talked about it. Isaiah says, And the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together, and they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. John 6, he's talking about all those people that followed Jesus. When Jesus turned around to them and said, If you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. Now, for the in a Gentile mindset, we might not fully understand what he's saying there, but these people, I believe, had an absolute understanding of what he was talking about because he was talking about a, a, a covenant relationship. In other words, it's like marriage. If you're not willing to be my one and only, you know, then, you know, we don't need to get married. And Jesus was turning them to them. It's kind of the same mindset. It's like marriage is a covenant. You know, if you're not willing to follow me only and no others, you know, if you're not willing to pursue me as the Lord of your life, then you don't have any part with me. That's when Peter said to the Lord, well, Lord, you know, these are some hard sayings. That's some difficult preaching. You're going to run some people off. He said to them, to Peter, he said, you're going to go also? To which Peter responded, to whom shall I go? He he had the wisdom to know it's about a personality. Am I going to follow God? Am I going to follow Jesus or am I going to follow the devil? He said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. And this is what it really gets down to. This whole issue of spirituality and life in Christ gets down to, to God, who He is, who He is in His Son, what He's given to us, how He's presented to us the way, the truth, and the life, and how there really is no other access unto Him but by, the, by, by Jesus the Son. Now, as you get into the study of apostates, you see as you look at this, there are a lot of people, like as in the Old Testament, who rejected the truth, but their evil is really compounded when these rejectors of truth become apostate teachers and leaders and prophets. Second Peter spoke with them, he says, but there were false prophets among the people in history, even as there shall be false teachers among you who will privately bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feign words Make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Now Peter was saying, and when he was written, this book was written before the book of Jude, you're getting ready to see a wave of apostasy. And there's going to be these false teachers. And they're going to come into the church. And these false teachers are going to deceive a lot of people. And they're going to do it for the sake of covetousness. Because they can so-called shear the sheep for their own benefit just to get something from them. And because of them, those of you who are genuine, you're going to be evil spoken of. You know, they're going to make you look like idiots, so what to say, which we've seen that in the culture that we're living in. He said, and, and, and they're covetous, where they're smooth, where they're feign words, they're lying words, you know, it's all about for them, just gain. And he said, their, their damnation, it doesn't slumber. Your judgment's coming upon those kind of people. Now the apostle, the the brother of Jesus, Jude, said, what Peter wrote about, it's happening now. He foretold it, he foresaw it, he prophesied it, now it's here and it's among us. And this is what Jude is saying, that's why I felt this necessity to preach unto you the word of God. Now in Jude 8 through 13, we'll probably only get through 8, maybe 9 and 10, he talks about four aspects of the apostates. And we dealt just a little bit, and he makes a reference back to what we've said. He talks about their character their conduct, their, their company, their character, and their condemnation. We're going to deal today mostly with their conduct. I don't think we're going to make it down to where he talks about Kor and Balaam and that. We'll do that next Sunday. But he's dealing with these issues uh, of the apostate and just what, what are they doing? Now, when we get into you know, their, 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 their character, we'll see a little bit more why they do what they do. But he explains what they're doing. And he calls them to remember the facts. It's just like in the same manner. And he kind of looks back over the, the verses that we talked about last week with, in verses 5 and 7, where he referred to Israel in the wilderness. He talked about the angels who left their habitation. And he talks about the sodomites. 
Now, we dealt with that last week. I, I think that may even be up on, the, on the YouTube. If you want to go back to YouTube and watch it, you can see it there. But the idea is there is showing that the attitude of the, the apostates in the present world he was living in is the same attitude that the apostates in the Old Testament had. He says, you know, they were ungodly. They were, they were, you know, they forsook the Lord. They rebelled against God. And he said, they're, they're the same way. So verse 8, he talks about in the same manner as the apostate angels, as the apostate, you know, uh, uh, Jewish people and the apostate sodomites who heard the truth, rejected the truth, didn't want to repent. He said, in the same way, and he lists three kind of things, and we'll talk about this on a great level in just a moment. In the same manner, he says, they despise the, they defile the flesh. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah did. They despise authority, just like these sinning angels who despise God's authority. And they speak evil of dignities. They, they blaspheme God. They murmur, just like the children of Israel murmured against God in the wilderness. These people murmur against God. They blaspheme the character of God. Now the thing about it is, is that you see all this history on these apostates. And we saw what happened to these angels. And we saw what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, right? You know, you see the history. It's amazing to me how that... Even though these people knew this history, you're still going to have the same problem that goes on. Amos kind of says it this way in, in chapter 4, verse 11. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning, yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. In other words, they had the truth, but they wouldn't come back to the truth. They wouldn't respond to the truth. Verse 5 through 7, we said last week, there's that indictment. He said, just like the Sodom and Gomorrah, Filled with lust and morality, so are you. Just like the angels rebelled, you're filled with rebellion. Just like the children of Israel had an irreverence for God and His Word and commitment to God, they did the same thing. They did. They followed in the same avenue. So this is they, just like they were. It's just like the present day apostles. So if you want to be able to kind of have a discerning heart about false teachers and apostasy that's going on in the church today and in the world we live in, he said you've got this history. Here's a lesson. Just read it and believe it. Don't be naive. Don't be simple-minded. Don't be open-minded to error. God's given us a clear venue. He's given us a clear word. It's truth. And so we can hold up truth to everything. And, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like the lie detector. All right? It will expose what is error. It will expose what is a lie. In fact, he refers to them in, in this verse, and King James puts it this way, he calls them filthy dreamers. Filthy dreamers. Now, the word dream here is, to, is, to, is, is a word which translated in, in the Greek language to, to dream something, all right? Uh, but it goes beyond that. It's more like a delusional dream. The word for dreamers in the, we're used most of the time for dreams of significance is this word onaris. And it has to do with something that's purposeful. Like Joseph had a dreams and they were purposeful. They were prophetic dreams, all right? They were fulfilled and they came true. This is not the word used in the Greek language. Here's the word used. It says this word, in, and this is from the Enhanced Strong's Lexicon. It says this word for dream that they use here means to be beguiled with sensual images and carried away to an impious course of conduct. In other words, it's fantasy world. It's living in a fantasy. It's living in a delusion. And you're defiled by your delusion. You believe your delusion. And that's certainly an accurate case of where we are. It, it literally means to have a confused state of soul that, that is marked by an abnormal imagination. Not a graced imagination. It's arbitrary fantasies that are so vivid to the dreamer that it makes reality and truth of no importance to them. Literally, they become deluded, beguiled. They don't receive the truth because they're living in a, in a dream world. So he gives us this kind of definition of them. We'll talk about it more a little bit next week. But that, that definition, he says, these filthy dreamers, these apostates, these dreamers, and he gives us a little list about their conduct that follows that. And there's about five things we'll mention quickly this morning. One, he says, they defile the flesh. That doesn't mean they're cutting themselves. That's defiling the flesh in some manner. But he's talking about immorality. And one thing about the apostate, Immorality always shows up. And I'll explain why in just a minute. But it always becomes an obvious part of their character. And if you follow the person, you think, you know, it might be a preacher or a teacher or a leader, he's saying, watch them long enough. If they're not the real thing, they will fall into gross immorality. And there'll be no repentance from it. 
Now, it is possible for believers to sin in this way. But if they're a genuine believer and not an apostate, they will come to genuine repentance. They'll turn from it. They'll get their heart right with God. They'll start pursuing Jesus in their life. They'll take steps of action to get their life right with God. Now, he's talking about leaders especially here. And there's a lot of people in churches today, we've seen this on many occasions, who get up and profess before and confess before an audience or a crowd their failure. Some have repented. Others have said and made excuses for their failure. Well, it's not my fault. I was born this way. We have churches in Houston, large churches in Houston, large churches in, in, uh, well, across America. Well, pastors have gotten up and embraced a homosexual lifestyle and said it's okay. Denying the truth, denying what God says, but it's okay. Well, why? Because they say it's okay. Filthy dreamers. Led them to a beguiled state of mind. They don't embrace the truth of God's word anymore. And, and, and I note that we are so ignorant in our culture, we have such little discernment in the church. That's why these letters are written to us. We have such little discernment in the church, we just continue to listen to people like that. And we, churches are filled with people who continue to follow people like that. It, it was back in the 90s, I, I think, when uh, the, there was a, a group of people who exposed that Paul Krauts of TBN had been involved in an immoral relationship, involved in homosexuality with his intern assistant. There was no repentance. There was no remorse that was given. It was taken into court and, and sealed by court records. Money was paid off. Finally, when it was exposed, Los Angeles reporter went to, you know, Pastor Krauss, asked him about it. He said, well, you know, he said, you know, it's not really my fault. I was drunk. What? <laughs> I guess it's okay then if you're drunk. So anytime you want to practice homosexual lifestyle, just go get drunk. Is that the way that leads? But that's, that's the way it comes out. You know, then later this young intern, young man who whatever it was comes in and says, you know, I'm going to make a million dollars. I'm selling a script I've written about your life story and my relationship to the to, to movie. Fa well, they went back into court again and sealed all the records and did all those things again. Little bleep in the headlines. Little, little, just a little blurb. There have been others who stood up and said, I have sinned against God and their lives have been turned around and they repented. There's, there's this fine line called genuine repentance. That's, that's what marks the difference between the two. One just, just goes on and justifies it or says, as some pastors have so-called come out of the closet in our culture and said, well, you know, it's okay today. God's changed his mind. It's that whole open theism concept we've talked about in the past where, you know, God has a different way of thinking about it today. Then others we've said who I want to apologize and just say, it, well, that's not really the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was inhospitality. He says, these men, you can tell apostates because they know the truth, but they reject the truth, and sexual vice and sin will control their lives. Now, here's the thing. If you don't really possess the Holy Spirit in your life, the flesh will run you. Let me put it this way. The flesh will ruin you. All right? But there is no way. If you're, going to put, if you're going to come and say to the world, I'm a believer. I've given my life to Christ. Satan's going to come against you with everything he can so as to make you look like an absolute fool so as to embarrass the church of Jesus Christ. He does that against true believers. He does it against false believers. All right? Peter warned about it. He says, hey, there are those who indulge in the flesh, you know, in their corrupt desires. They despise authority. He's given a description over there. Jude's saying the same thing. They don't want what God says, so they just defile the flesh, and they'll do what they want to do because that's their desire. And now, the idea here with the, with the apostate is, what happens if you don't have the Holy Spirit to help you control desires, all right, and to help you say no to sin, you're going to stumble and fall every time. There's no way that anybody ultimately can have absolute control over their flesh because it is corrupt. We have a fallen nature. The Bible says that the deeds of the flesh will always be manifest. Sooner or later, it's going to pop out, all right? You can cover it up, you can hide it, but sooner or later, it will be exposed. There's the fruit of the Spirit, and there's the corrupt fruit of the flesh. It's always going to, a tree is going to produce fruit one way or the other, all right? He says, so, I mean, how can you, how can you control the desires of the flesh? Unless you have the Holy Spirit in your life, unless you're going to be filled with the Spirit in your life, it will always lead to the only place it knows that. It runs to the, the course of the, of the gutter, so to say, and it leads to more immorality. In 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, Tim, we, we, show, we saw this one verse, but there's another verse I want to show you that 2 Peter wrote 
eight verses later, these people speak out arrogant words of vanity. In other words, that's empty words. They entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. So there's just people, you know, they're just going to follow their own lust. Now, if you look in chapter one of, of, of chapter two, he says, hey, it's, this is why it's important that if you become a Christian, the first thing you add to your Christian life is morality, virtue. Add to your faith virtue. And he talks about loving kindness and disciplines of, the, of your life and all these other areas. But he said the first ground rule for every Christian is get a grip on your morality. Let Jesus control these desires of your life. You know, that, that, they're, they're, that God has given every one of us desires. You follow the wrong course in satisfying those desires, it leads to corruption. It, it's why we talk about premarital sex or sodomy and anything else. We've all been given a sex drive, but when you try to satisfy any God-given desire in a God-forbidden way, it's what leads to sin, which leads ultimately to death. He said, this is the mark of the apostates. This is how you know, though. In 2 Peter chapter 3, he went on to say in the next chapter, knowing this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come and they're mocking, well, they will be following their own lust. So what they do, they choose to, they can't, they can't have any over authority or any power over sin because, you know, the only thing is that's Jesus, amen. And so they end up following their sin. And then they mock those who are righteous. They mock those who do exercise control. They mock those who have spiritual disciplines in their life. They mock people who are committed to Christ, who are under the lordship of Jesus. And they make... A, a laughing stock out of you. Well, that's pretty easy to see. Turn on any prime time family network, ABC, NBC, CBS, whatever it might be, and watch what goes on in prime time. If by chance there is a teacher, a preacher, a Christian in there, he's an absolute idiot and a fool, a drunk and a, and a womanizer. Well, that's true of a lot of them, amen? But it's true of a lot of apostate ones. This is where it comes to, they'll mock you, they'll laugh at you. This is why Satan targets them to make the world think that they are representative of what we are in Christ. And it's marked by defiling the flesh. But it also says they despise dominion and authority. Now this, based, this is an, a sin of arrogance, all right? They literally have a contempt for God. What's what it come, boils down to, and a contempt for God's word and the truth of God's word. It says they despise this is a really unique word in the Greek language, which has to do with to making something of, of no value, all right? It, it just it doesn't, yeah, okay, God's got a big deal, but that, that doesn't mean anything, all right? It's the word atheteo, and it signifies that there's, there's, you don't have to pay any attention to it. In other words, it's the idea of this is established truth, that God is God, Jesus is Lord, the Word of God is truth. But I just, I just reject that, all right? That's what the apostate does. He knows it. This is the deal with the apostate. Not like somebody who's a, out here is an atheist doing it. This is somebody who has a familiarity with the word of God. He says, okay, I know that, but I reject that. God's God, but he's not my God. Jesus is Lord, but he's not my Lord. Truth is truth, but I, I, I don't want the truth. And we've seen a lot of that in the culture from, you know, from, from the Jim Joneses of the age to the, maybe some of you might have been familiar with Marjo, you know, in the 60s and the 70s, this pretend false apostate preacher and went on later to become an actor. You know, the idea is that they just don't want God. They re, we read that back in that verse in, 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 earlier. It says they reject only the Lord, Savior, and Master, Jesus Christ. The word dominion here is that when it says they reject dominion, it's the Greek word kuriatis, which deals with lordship. We, we talked about two weeks ago this word, and even a little bit last week of the word kurios, that God has raised up Jesus and given him the name of Lord. They basically, in a nutshell, the apostate says, not my Lord, not over me, not over my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. Now, you see that whole mindset that as part of the nature of Satan himself, right? You, you see it in, in, in our own corrupt, fallen nature, whether it's a young person who says, uh, yeah, you may be my parent, but I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. You know, I know what the cops say. I know what the law says. I'm, whether it's in civil, parental, church, whatever. I know what the truth is, but I'm not going to do that. I don't care. I just want to do what I want to do, which is certainly in character with the devil who rejects all authority, who rejects all moral laws, all laws in general. In fact, the Bible, when it talks about the Antichrist, calls him, you know, the, the lawless one. He doesn't want anything to do with God's word. He resists authority. A lot of people resist authority. I mean, most people spend their whole life resisting authority. But these people are people who know better. These people who knew the truth, and, but yet wouldn't embrace the truth, they know what the Bible says. 
They don't want anybody telling them what to do. But isn't that the culture we live in? Isn't that America today? Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Nobody has a right to tell me what I can do. Nobody has a right to tell me what I can't do. I'm going to do what I want to do. Why? Because I'm God of my life. I'm in charge. That's why Jude, I mentioned the verse just a moment ago in verse 4 when he said, They are ungodly persons and they turn the grace of God in licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. That's that word curious again. They deny the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, the thing about an apostate many times is, you know, they, they'll acknowledge everything I'm saying, but they, they'll say that's not me because they reject the fruit of their own life. They won't pay attention. It's that delusion. They turn the grace of God into licentiousness. They say, well, I'm under grace, so I can continue to do what I want to do. But the Bible tells us, if you understood grace, that the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness. So we don't understand grace if that's our so-called excuse. So they fight God's right, ultimately, to be God. They resist God. Now, if they go on with religiosity, they're like the Gnostics of Paul's day. The Gnostics who believed, you know, that, uh, well, yeah, there's God and there's this spirit life and there's this rebirth we experience now through Jesus even. They'll claim that part of it. But they, they had this idea, that's my spirit person, but I'm also a flesh person, a body, and so, you know, I'll nurture my spirit being, but also do what I want to with my flesh. It's two different things. They don't influence one another. That's, 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 that, that's that early steps of apostasy with Gnosticism that we saw in the early days of the church. So they despise authority. You still with me? Seat belts are still available. They speak evil of glories. Now, I love this. Glories is the Greek word doxos. You know, in the New American Standard, it says they speak evil of angelic majesties. I don't think that's the best translation of it, you know. Some people say, well, it's talking about doxos. It means angels. When I, when I literally believe because how this word is used so many times in talking about the glory of God, this word doxos has to do with the Trinity. They speak evil against God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, you know. They're not going to speak evil against God. These people will. They'll speak evil against the doxas. And the word speak there is the word we get the word blaspheme from. They literally blaspheme God. So I would never do that. When we're, basically, you can do it without saying it by just rejecting God in your life. Said even, and use that illustration about even Michael, you know, he's the kind of the super angel, the archangel. Michael, the archangel, will not speak against God. Satan. I think that's why they sometimes translate angelic. I think it goes higher. And they say, well, that's, what, what's all that about? You know, when Satan shows up, to, to, he claims the body of Moses. Well, you know the story in the Old Testament how that Joshua was put in charge of leading the children of Israel because Moses had struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to the rock. And we saw how that's really a picture of Christ and what all that means when we've preached and taught on that in the past. And so he wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. So Moses goes up on the hill and watches the children of Israel go into the promised land, I, I suppose. I mean, what else are you going to do? There's nothing on TV. So y'all can need to loosen up this morning, okay? <laughs> <laughs> he goes up there and the Bible says, and God... Got Somebody got their pinball machine out? <laughs> it's one thing to have your phone in church. another thing to bring your pinball machine, all right? But he goes up, and Satan comes, and when, when Moses dies, says, and, and Moses' eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. What's that mean? He died too young, basically. I mean, he still had plenty of physical energy for living. But the Lord takes him home, and there's his body, all right? The Lord doesn't take him physically home, um, but he takes his, his soul and spirit home to be with the Father. And so here's the body, and the angel says, I'll take that. It's an angel called Satan, who's a fallen angel. He comes in, and he claims the body of Moses. Well, God sends Michael, the archangel, down to contend with the devil over this deal. And, uh, and, and the archangel is, is smart enough. He's not going to sit there and say, you dirty so-and-so, you're a rotten, you traitor, you left, you know. He just says, the Lord rebuke you. And he imposes the authority of the Lord. And we say, well, what, what's the devil going to do with the body of Moses? I, I don't know. Probably starting some new Moses cult. Who knows? I'm sure he could prop up a body somewhere and put it under glass and say, and have people lining up by the tens of millions to come and worship Moses' body. All right. You say, that's ridiculous. How, how many of you have ever been to Jerusalem before? Uh, some of y'all been with me before. How many times have you been approached while you were in Jerusalem with somebody wanting to sell you a piece of the cross? They come up with a little, or, or, or a piece of wood. This comes off the cross. $100. A buck? 
There have been enough pieces of the cross found to rebuild the twin tires in New York. <laughs> Amen. So, and, and, but people venerate stuff. I mean, there's just, you know, it's this cultic mindset that, uh, of, of fallen nature that we have. And the, the, the angel simply says, the Lord rebuke you. And by the way, that's the same authority that he had that we have. And by, also, by the way, that's not the first time that Michael and Satan have had a contradiction with each other and an encounter with each other. You saw it in Daniel chapter 10 when the angel is, is bringing an answer to Daniel saying, you know, when the day you prayed, God heard your prayer. But Satan has been fighting against seeing that prayer fulfilled. Well, prayer is spiritual battle in the spiritual arena. Amen. And so he, the, the Lord rebukes the enemy through, through the angel of God. Uh, and, uh, He's, but he's not going to bring these railing accusations. Just simply exercises God's authority. So if you're, if you're having a struggle with the enemy, with his demons, with, you, it's not going to do you any good to sit down and make a list of dirty names to call him. All right? There's no authority in dirty name calling and just simply critiquing the devil. It's the Lord rebuke you. You exercise the authority that God has given you in your life and take authority over what Satan's doing in your life. But as he goes through this list here, now they're speaking evil authorities. You see several things about their, their conduct. I mean, physically they're immoral. Intellectually we'll see just what they're arrogant. Spiritually they're blasphemers. And he talks about this arrogance. He says they speak about things they don't know about. Verse 10, these men revile the things which they do not understand. Why don't they understand them? Because truth is is given to us by the great teacher, the Holy Spirit, who lives in us through the Word of God. And these people will not embrace the Word of God, nor will they accept the ministry of the Holy Spirit in their life. They, re they reject God's authority over their life. And so they choose to believe a lie. And they don't understand the truth. And so what they do, they begin to revile it. Or as he said earlier, they just begin to mock it. Oh, I can't believe you're so stupid. You Christians are out of your mind. I can't. I asked me a guy one, one time, came to me and said, I, I just can't believe you're stupid enough to believe the Bible. I said, well, what are you stupid enough to believe? <laughs> We're all going to believe something. I think I'm stupid enough to believe the truth. Yeah. Amen. All right, somebody ought to praise the Lord. Don't, don't, don't take that as some kind of, well, they think I'm stupid. Yes, they think you're stupid, but you're not. So don't, don't go pouting to your mama about it. They laughed at me at work today. What did you think they were going to do? Have a party? Put your name up as employee of the month and give you a free parking place up front? That's not going to happen. And more so now than ever before. They speak evil about the things they don't even understand. And it says, he goes on number five, it says they're corrupted by the things that they do understand. That King James, look at this, is what they know naturally is brute beast and those things corrupt themselves. And SB says, and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they're destroyed. Brute, there's the word alogia. As they know, as, as they know it's, in other words, it's somebody who does, it's somebody who doesn't have the word, but has the basic instincts to know what's right and wrong, God's given them a conscience, they reject that. They justify that. Their wrongdoings and their errors. They just say, I don't care, I'm going to do what I want to do. And this is what happens when the flesh begins, you know, to take control in your heart and your life. As you grow older in your life, you can't control it. You may think you can get a handle on it, but you cannot, except by the power of God's grace and by the power of God's spirit, is there it, that's the only way to victory in your life, or that your own desires will destroy you. So you have these people, I mean, they blaspheme the truth, they limit themselves to just a physical world, and they perish in the midst of that even, at their own corruption, by their own hands, their physical indulgence, those are the very things says, that damn them, their own desires. I love this quote from Michael Green. Let me read this to you. He says, he says, you know, if a man is persistently blind to spiritual value and deaf to the call of God and rates self-determination as the highest good, and that's where we're at, the time will come when he cannot hear the call, he is spurned, but he's left to the mercy of the turbulent instincts to which he once turned in search of freedom. Those instincts, given free reign, are merciless. Lust, when indulged, becomes a killer. That's what Jude is trying to say here. The things that they do know by those things, and they, they perish in those. Now, 
this message is so vitally important. This whole series is extremely important to where we are in the church today. I believe this is such an accurate picture of our, of, of our world and such an accurate picture of the church, especially in the Western Hemisphere. I think this is even more, more prominent, that we see it here today. And what this means is, you know, a lot of people say, well, I guess persecution is coming for Christians. That shows the blindness on your part. It is already here. We're long past the church and persecution. We're already facing a whole new level of persecution. It's already being in place. It's already in place in laws now. It's just waiting for the first processes to start. You say, how can you say such a thing? This is America, land of free, home of brave, and God we trust. We don't trust in God. We have a court system that's so defiled. We have a system of ethics and values that has no ethics or values to it. You know, we're waiting for the government to tell us what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And if the government says it's okay, then it must be okay. And we're going to sit around and wait for the state to determine by politicians who are going to argue over what is morally acceptable or not morally acceptable. And if they say it's morally acceptable, then we'll just accept it. We're in a, we're in a mess today. I mean, you may not even realize what the federal government did this last week by, via the Supreme Court basically has come down and made the statement although they didn't come through and make it a federal law saying that homosexual marriages were acceptable nationally now, they did come through and make their own little change, saying that the Supreme Court has made the decision that if you do have a homosexual relationship, a marriage, a connection, whatever it might be, that now you are also will be treated under the law as those who are married. So that when it's time to file your taxes, returns, your Social Security, your benefits, all those things, no problem. Doesn't matter what the state says, doesn't matter what the people say. You saw what happened to the Defense of Marriage Act in California when the majority of the people said, we stand in defense of marriage. Supreme Court says, sorry, you can't. What's, what's happening? The government's telling us what we can do. The government's telling us what's acceptable. And the church and the people and Christians too often follow along like blind sheep, missing the mark completely. It's so acceptable today to, to let sin be rampant in your life. I was listening, I, I, I would think that some of the national leaders in, the, in the, the movement for freedom and civil rights would have turned over in their grave after hearing what took place on the mall. When spiritual leaders, government leaders got up and went on to these great speeches, many of them, and they, they'd say stuff like, you know, it's time you know, that we realize the dream, and, you know, we realize that all men are created equal. I'm all for that. You know, you know, I, you know me, I believe there's only one race anyway. It's the holy race. We're, we're the people of God. But amen, that, that's what that boils down to. But then you get leaders, many of, who get up and just playing for the vote. You know, it doesn't matter if we're white, we're black, we're American Indians, we're Native Americans, whatever we are, and they always tag on, or whether we're straight or gay. Excuse me, your sexual deviation doesn't have anything to do with your race. At all. Your sexual preference doesn't have anything to do with race at all. But in our country... You know, we want to lap it in there because we all want civil rights. If we're going to do that for homosexuals, I demand civil rights for thieves and bank robbers. It's just a sin. Homosexuality, it's a sin. But that's what I want to do. This is what he's saying. This, you get led by your desires. When you're led by your desires, then you're in trouble. If what your desires do is make you who you are then it had anything to do with your DNA. It hadn't got anything to do with your race. It hadn't got anything to do with white, black, brown, pink, or blue. You're just a sinner who chose to sin. That's what it all boils down to. But Brother Joe, I have this desire. <laughs> Sometimes I have a desire just to slap somebody. <laughs> Hard. <laughs> Amen? I had, I, on the way over, I'll be honest, folks, I had a desire to just run into a guy. You know, I'm on a mission for God, getting between campuses. <laughs> you know, only car on the road, guy pulls up to a stop sign and pulls right out in front of me. Stand up on the brakes, and he goes one block and makes a left turn. Grace. 
came over me or I would have been late. <laughs> I had a real strong desire. But does me having this strong desire make it right? No. People say, oh, Brother Joe, I, just, I have this temptation towards homosexuality. Some people have temptations towards adultery. Some people have temptations towards premarital sex. Some people have temptations towards little children. Lust, when it's conceived, brings forth sin, which brings forth death. Now, if you're with me, say, uh huh. I don't like that. Well, I didn't write it, he did. And I've discovered that if you'll live by it, it'll change your life. And literally, God can change your desires and sanctify you. There's some areas in your life you may wrestle with your entire life, but you don't have to wrestle from the position of defeat. You wrestle from the position of victory. There's freedom in Jesus Christ. But our culture, you've got to get where we are, folks. If you're not praying, it's a good sign you don't understand what I'm talking about today. We've got to get back to seeking God's face. We've got to get back to praying. We've got to get back to praying for revival. We've got to get to praying for our families. Your children, parents, your grandchildren are going to face battles like you never faced or even thought about facing. Your children will face imprisonment over some of these issues. For standing their ground. I don't believe it. It already happens. You can't, you can't, in the U.S. Army, and Eric, you can verify this, if he's standing around talking to two or three other soldiers and they're talking about homosexuality and they don't agree with it, and somebody comes by, an officer, a non-officer, and says, and here's what you're talking about and here's your opinion, he can report you. There's already a sergeant right now, he's suing the federal government because they took away things from him and they took away his position from him because he made his own personal statement about homosexuality. The government says, you can't give your personal estimation because we've already mandated what's acceptable. You guys with your God and guns and Bibles. That's, that's the mindset. That's not just, a, that's not just a, a mistake being said. That's the mindset of the way the Christian world is looked on today. That's the mindset of the world you're living in. You are, you are weird. You are strange. You are backwards. You are degenerate. You haven't grown up. You don't know the truth. You just are intolerant, unbearable judges of culture and society. How dare you? That's the mindset. I was watching the news the other day. I was listening to this story on who was the, 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 the is it Manning? Is that the guy who gave all the way the WikiLeaks stuff? And, you know, he's a, a, a private in the Army, and he gave away all these secrets of America to, to the foreign enemies and stuff, and everybody just knows what we're doing. But, you know, his court was, his case was this, you know, you can't, you can't blame me. You know, I have gender confusion. I'm a little confused. Well, go stand in front of the mirror, let will solve it for you. You'll figure that in a minute. <laughs> and so since he's confused, we really can't impose any harsh, stiff penalties upon him. But that's not my point, all right? My point is this. All the networks, except one of those two, Fox, has referred to Private Manning now, not in the male sense. They call him she now. And many of them are pressing the government, along with his lawyers, trying to force the government to pay for his, here's the terminology, gender reassignment. In prison. In prison. You see where we've come to? And I would not doubt that another two, three, five years from now, he'd probably get it. Some of you thought I was crazy when I told you three or four years ago that it will not be very long, probably within a decade, that homosexuality will be on every state in a federal law. Remember, people used to laugh at Jerry Falwell 30 years ago when he made these statements and stood up against these issues. Oh, you're out of your mind. That's never going to happen. And I could go on, and you could go on, because you probably know as many of these things as I do about this, what's happening around us culturally. But we cannot be naive, and we cannot say, well, it's no big deal for us, it's not going to bother us. It's affecting everything around you. Amen. And it will eventually affect your influence of freedom to worship. There are churches being shut down in different parts of the world today by having stands on moral issues. Pastors who get locked up all the time for having stands on moral issues. Just to, pre just to say, this is my conviction. I can't make you live anyway, but here's what the truth is. 
And if we do not somehow open our eyes to see just how far down this pit we already are, there's no getting out of it. It's never too late for revival. But I do know that the prophets and what was given to us hundreds of years ago and before that thousands of years have been right on the mark of where we would go culturally and where we would go spiritually. And we're there. I'm not even going to give it a public altar call this morning. Because I think too often, you know, we, we want to come up and be almost Catholic in our approach to our Hail Marys and go back home and be nothing again, do nothing again. But I'm going to ask that without any music, without any invitation being given at all today, for you to bow your head right where you are. And to ask God to drive home the reality of where we are in the world today. I believe we're very close to the coming of Jesus. But this is no time for sitting down and being idle and not praying and not reaching and not loving, not caring about people's souls. I'd ask you to pray for your own heart first. God, give me, give me a clean heart during these days. The Bible says, because iniquity will abound in the end times in Matthew 24, the love of many will grow cold. Ask God to keep a fire burning in your heart for him to restore a fire if it seems to be going out. I'm not saying we walk out of here and we're arrogant and we're judgmental. No. We don't have to worry about the judgment part. God's already taken care of all that. We go out here with, as missionaries of light and hope. There's a better life. There's a better world. There's a better way. And it's through Christ. Ask God to give the boldness to be that kind of person. Filled with Holy Spirit unction. Who won't be intimidated who won't be shouted down, who it doesn't, it's not the issue of being put down, it's just going to say, I'm going to be what God wants me to be. And as you pray for yourself, I want you to pray for your family. Pray for your children, pray for your grandchildren. And ask God to put them ever before you. We don't need to be lulled to sleep at this time. Our heart doesn't need to grow cold at this time. This is the time we need to refire the engines. Father, as we look at the Word and then we look where we are, how can we ignore the truth of Scripture? You so clearly laid out what would happen, and here we are. But Lord, we know that you could have had us been born at any time, in any generation, in any place in history. Lord, each of us in this room were born at this time. And if we're your children, we're born with a purpose, born again with, with a goal, born again with a reason for your kingdom, for your glory, for the cause of Christ. May we not be content with status quo. May our church not be content. May we as individuals not be content. May we as parents, as young people, as grandparents, seize this moment. As it says in the book of Esther, for such a time as this, a critical hour, you've brought us into the kingdom at this time, Father. Don't let us miss the call. Don't let our ears be deaf. Don't let our hearts be more in love with our lust than we are in love with you. Let us, God, have ears to hear, eyes to see, fill our hearts with faith. God, as we look at this dark day, we don't look at it with fear. We know what's coming. We know you're coming. We, well, there's an excitement that burns in our very inner heart and being. We know that all things work together. We know that, Lord, that you're the Lord of glory and you're going to put the enemy in the pit. We know that peace and righteousness are going to reign forever. But Lord, in this moment in time that you've given us, don't let us get comfortable. Don't let us sit on the sidelines. Speak to our hearts. Guide us with your truth. Show us what we're to be and what we're to do in this moment. Lord, as long as we're breathing, let us know that we, you're not through with us. 
there's still something to accomplish, to move forward, to experience you, to know your voice, to live the life you've called us to. Be glorified in these hearts and lives. And Father, as pastor over this fellowship, I pray for the flock here, as we do often. Bind the wicked one. The Lord rebuke you, Satan, from the hearts and the homes that are under this umbrella, which you've given me oversight of. Protect them. Move them to the place of deep, deeper love with you than they've ever been in their life. Use them for your glory. Help us to shine like the lights in the dark that we are. In the precious name of Jesus, And everybody said, Amen.